Hello, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Mo. And this is Team Get Over Yet. We're an all female team participating in the greatest motoring adventure on the planet the Mongol Rally. We'll be driving 10,000 miles across mountains, deserts, and unknown terrain. And along the way, we hope to spread our feminist and environmental ideals. Join us here as we share our stories, thoughts, and interviews as we get ready for the Mongol Rally 2021. Uh, don't you mean 2022? Shit! Welcome back! Hey! We're so excited to record this episode today. We're joined by our friends and fellow podcasters, Megan and Melinda from My Favorite Feminists. So as you can guess, uh, they host a feminist podcast where they talk about women from the arts and sciences. And we got to say, we love the work that you're doing. Women are far too often excluded from the history books. So what you guys are doing, bringing their life work to the fore, uh, it's so important and very interesting. So, oh, well, thanks let's, for having us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. So, let's cut to the chase and get to the introductions. Would you guys like to in- introduce yourselves to our listeners? Uh, Megan, would you like to go first? Yeah, of course. I'm a, I'm a figurative sculptor and painter located out in Richmond, Virginia. And along with Milena, my best friend, we co host my favorite feminist podcast. And it's been, it's been really fun because it definitely feeds into my art interests. And I think for Milena, it does the same for her with her science interest. It's, it's been a lot of fun. My, um, my science background is not at all traditional. It didn't start until very late in life. So being able to like explore science while also learning about women that like, I can look up to like, that's probably the, the like the reason we still going is just to like, learn about these women and being able to share it because you, you pull up these names and people are like, I'm sorry, who is that? And you're like, Oh, you know, just the person who discovered like eight comets. It's fine. It's great. (laughs) Technology. Well, let me tell you. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, it's been pretty chill. Um, Oh God, I guess around me, huh? Oh no. Um, Yeah. So my background is actually mostly photography and journalism and writing. Um, But then I graduated and decided I wanted to get into veterinary medicine and then it just kind of like rolled from there so it was about I don't know just relearning things and refreshing and it's been helpful that's really cool yeah nice and so so now Milena you're a vet tech right uh I was so it 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 went from veterinary medicine to human medicine. Oh. It was like a six year, yeah, morph. I mean, I mean, I mean, I have three animals. You see me walk down the street, like I touch every dog, every single dog I see. <laughs> um, so I still love them, but I think it, it was a better fit to move on to human medicine. And it's been a little bit of a journey, but it's been great. <laughs> so what, what type of human medicine do you like focus on? Is it like nursing or is it just like... So right now I'm in radiology. I'm an assistant there, Um, but I will be hopefully getting into a physician assistant program very soon and diagnosing and treating my own patients, hopefully very soon. Cool. Another, another degree to add to the mix. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) We don't talk about that. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. How many, how many degrees do you have? I only two. Okay. (laughs) Only only two. (laughs) No big deal it's fine and it's not like I mean I went it's like an associate's and then a bachelor's and then this this PA would be essentially a master's degree in in medicine so it's not like I'm yeah I'm gone I'm just doing the steps don't give me that face (laughs) yeah that's pretty fabulous and then yeah Megan so you're sculpting now yeah yes yeah do you have any interesting projects on the go in the studio um yeah so for a while now i've been working on a series of portraits they're all busts of women caught in kind of fairly mundane moments but it's been really rewarding because the narratives of the pieces aren't typically things that are found in finer depictions of the female form so right now i've got a piece in the works and it's been so much fun to sculpt 
So the face is kind of like pushed back and there's a whole bunch of like double chins because the chin is tucked towards the neck. And it's a fairly startled face. And the title of this one is, oh, Jesus, there's a bug in the tub. So <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> love it. Cool. Hey, when you see <laughs> portrait sculptures in museums, they're always very stiff and very stuffy. And it's usually a lot of just wealthy, dead white men. So I like to have fun and kind of play with a whole different new avenue of content that isn't typically represented in those fine art depictions. So that is, that's what I'm working on right now. That's good. I really like that. Like, I think, you know, art should be a reflection of life. And I think that's a, it's a more accurate reflection of things that mostly happen. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it it makes it kind of an accessible point. And it's rewarding when people, they reach out online and they're like, you know, uh, let's say like the neck creases like on your neck. Um, I had someone reach out and they're like, I don't think I've ever seen that in the sculpture before. Because speci- specifically within like female forms, it's often this glorify or um, glorification of beauty and leaving out things like stretch marks or wrinkles or just all these little imperfections that for me are immensely satisfying when sculpting the human form. That I, I find people really respond to that when you're like, oh, look, you know, you can see some the sculpture has blackheads or zits or whatever it may be. Yeah. Mm. The sculpture actually yeah, looks like a regular that. human being and isn't hasn't been edited or uh, what's the thing that they use? Photoshop to look yeah. as perfect as possible. Yeah. And I think there's been like a lot of demand for that lately, especially in the modeling industry and advertising industries and stuff. A lot of people want like more real, realistic looking people (laughs) so i think that's fabulous first question for both of you so how did you two meet each other and was it bffs at first sight (laughs) do it should i okay it was not bffs at first sight i was too loud for her oh (laughs) okay so we we happened we went to high school together we shared a class freshman year and Milena insists that I hated her. And it's not that I hated her. It's just that I didn't care for her. <laughs> she was loud. And I had no time for that. <laughs> fast forward a bit. I won one Gosh. mutual party for New Year's Eve. We ended up together <laughs> in a small bathroom, giggling quite a bit together. And in that moment, we were we were reborn as best friends, and it's been that way for about fifteen years now. So <laughs> it took a little wow. bit, but it was it. it was because I was loud. I was the I was up, and I was like looking for other people who were up because we were told to go to bed because we were like teenagers or whatever. I was also like a sleepover, and she was the only one awake. And I was like, I see you. And then somehow I got her to follow me in a bathroom. And here it's we are. The extrovert <laughs> in her. I, I'm an introvert, so I think together we, we balance out pretty well. Um, but yeah, that could have gone horribly wrong, but thankfully it didn't. And here we are all those years later. <laughs> Can't fantastic. get rid of each other. <laughs> yeah, f- 15 years. That's a pretty long friendship. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I know well. people from 15 years ago, but I don't I don't know if we still consider each other friends. <laughs> it. It, it was weird because I was an army brat growing up. So like I had friends and then we moved and then I never spoke to them again. Yeah. Uh, and then I expected that when I got to Maryland where we went to school and then it turns out I got to keep one. Yay. <laughs> she can't what do you think me? is the secret for like to your success? Oh. Like like successful friendship, I mean, like you know, why? How is it that you've stayed friends for so long? Oh no, I yeah. I think I even... in general we just we complement one another, and mm. like like being like Milena is my best friend. Like she helps make me a better person, and that sounds super cheesy, but it's true. Is that she brings out qualities in me that like no one else can, and I I feel like just having that that balance between the two of us is why it's worked out for so well i mean given we still have disagreements but i mean that's completely natural just gonna (laughs) you're making her tear up she's just like oh god fuck megan (laughs) 
I love you. Bye. I love you too. I mean, no, I mean, no. It's the that's when. She, what's that? Go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say like you're also like really pretty and can reach tall places because I'm kind of short. So that's true. Yeah. That's very true. <laughs> Mostly the second. Oh, second yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I no, I mean like there are a lot of um like it's it's true what she says that we like bring the best out of each other because honestly, like the person that I am today, I would not have existed without her influence. Wow. Like straight up, like I was not that person. I was not this person before I met her. And she taught me a lot about independence and being my own woman. Uh, I mean, I already kind of had that in me to begin with, but she like pulled, pulled it, out. it out. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. I get it. It's so beautiful. I'm tearing up too. <laughs> <laughs> what inspired you guys to start your podcast together? Oh, it was Milana's okay. idea. Again, she's so the I extrovert. Really, honestly, it, it was my idea. I don't, I don't think... I came up with the exact premise, but I was actually listening to, um, I was like really big into, uh, and this is why we drink. Mm, okay. Um, for a while. And with the thing that I really loved about them is like, they also have a great relationship and they like go back and forth and like, you can feel that like they've known each other forever. Mm. And I was, this was also around the time where I was feeling, um, I don't know what it was. It was something in like, I can't remember like what was going on in the news then, but it was a lot of like this feeling of unrest on like being a woman and uh, there was a certain not election. Having... Oh yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Our, our last that. Yeah. presidency. That... Yes. It was bad. Um, I was just angry. And I was like, let's talk about being women because I'm angry and I love you and I don't want to do anything without you. And she was like, awesome. And then we went back and forth on to like what it was going to be. And it was her idea to make it about like women in history and the arts and sciences because like these are both things that like, like we kind of know about, but like Mm. she's the artist and like I'm the scientist. So it was just like, being able to encompass everyone, no matter what it is, and to appreciate no, whatever side of a coin you're on, and to appreciate the other person that you're like learning about, and like something that's different, something that you're not used to, mm. um, and also exploring the idea of being a woman in the working world and not being recognized for the work that you do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. Like, you know, the more the more stuff I listen to, like podcasts and even even in surprising places where I wouldn't really expect it to to come up. Like, you know, these days I feel like I'm constantly learning about women in history from yeah, different fields, arts, sciences, uh everywhere. And you know, and I never heard of these women before. I never heard of their work before. And and even like a lot of the work that the these women were doing just generally sometimes have been attributed to men, but now it's kind of coming out and it's like, well, no, actually the men didn't do it. Women did. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing how much that stuff has changed. And I think it's also like extremely important to like give people credit where credit is due. Of course. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you can find this information in surprising places. Like I got a Christmas gift from Sam who unfortunately couldn't make it to the podcast today. And Mm -hmm. She got me a crochet book for Christmas and it was about iconic women in history. And like, there are at least three or four people in that book that I was just like, who are you? What did you do? Now I have to do some research because I had no nothing. And it was just like, it was shocking, surprising, and very interesting to like do the research and figure out who these women were. And then just like, yeah, I'm going to crochet a doll that kind of, that's in your likeness because I can. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. And then so, and you said it was Milena's idea, but Megan, like, what was your reaction to that at first? Oh, when when she initially proposed a podcast, I was like, there's no way in hell. We're not doing that. (laughs) Um, I myself, I'm a very private person. And so I, it took a few months for me to sit on the idea and gradually we came around and then 
the idea came up for well, let's explore interests that you and I were both passionate about and you know there's both there's room to to grow and explore and so that's where you know with my background in arts her interest in science that it came to fruition and even then after the initial idea it still took months to figure out okay how do we how do we do this like just the logistics of it but We've been doing it for quite a while now, and ever since jumping in, it's been just so rewarding and satisfying to have this project that we're doing together fairly like every other week, and then all the amazing weird things that we're learning from it. Like what the heck a normal school is? Like why? Mm. Teaching normal school? Yeah. What's that? Like... (laughs) (laughs) You want to take this one, Megan? (laughs) So that used to be the term applied to universities that were specifically geared towards educating people to become teachers. Oh, specifically women. Uh, yeah, oh. it was typically women. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like that was one of those things where like we we came across that like less than a month ago, a month like little a little more than a month ago. And at first it was me, and like the next week or the next person that she did. She was like, oh my god, she went to a normal school. And I was like, why is this suddenly popping out? Why are we still learning about these things in history that, like, we never knew existed? And it's, like, those little, like, nuggets and stuff. Mm. You're like, I didn't even know that there was a school, like, like geared towards that. Like, because you have certain colleges and universities, like, geared towards education, whatever. But when you, like, when you're back in, the, like, the early 1900s, late 1800s, you're a woman and your choices are so limited. They had whole ass institutions to keep you in line. Oh, yeah. And it's just like... To title you into a respectable profession. Right. Yeah, to <laughs> teach you how to be a good little girl <laughs> to sit there, wait for your husband, make him dinner, and, you know, embroider stuff while you wait. Yeah. Yeah, and it's wild. And, and then I guess, like, one one of the benefits of that is that you can kind of see what happened in the past and then also see how it's still affecting today. the current. Yeah, today. Yeah, what's happening now. Oh, yeah, really good stuff. Okay. So, oh, and speaking of, so I'd imagine that the information of these women and feminist figures is sometimes scant, right? Because, I mean, it, it's a little bit hard to find information about that. So, how do you conduct your research? Like, what kinds of uh, sources do you usually use to get your information? We're two very different people. Okay. <laughs> like, I go really hard on academic publications. And if I can get my hands on someone's thesis, that is great. Wow. Nice. That is. And every now and again, something does come up. Every every time. So I'm a really big dork. That's what I really enjoy going into. Um, we share an account for JSTOR, which is just a database for scholarly articles and journal entries that mm-hmm. once you make an account, it, it is free access. There is a bit of a paywall, but there's a lot available for people if you just want to sign up for a really basic account. And that's mm-hmm. been so helpful finding material for the the content that we're covering. Um and then from there, for me, there's little offshoots. Like like I said, if I can find like someone's thesis that happened to cover a period or a person that I'm interested in, or usually um, universities, if they've had a, a publication of sorts, that's usually where I like to stay in. But every now and again, mm-hmm. there, there's just a complete lack. Um, typically, mm. that's because it's an artist that I'm interested in that is outside of like our Western canon. And I feel like that might be an arena where it's more a language barrier that they haven't really bridged over into English academic content. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's lagging a bit and that's where things get a little bit more loosey goosey in terms of what I might be able to find. So that's, that's how I approach things. Milena is different. (laughs) (laughs) Uh huh. Luck. (laughs) I was going to say she has a Cheshire grin on her face. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, no, I mean, like, ugh. I, she, when she does things, she goes hard and she'll pull out like really random, like, like, how did you get to this point? How did you get to this article? Why is this? Why? Like, how did you stumble across this? Uh, for me, I like, when I first started, I was like, look, I know I have a journalism degree. I probably shouldn't be looking at wiki, but like at the same time, like 
I know how to like also like I won't use something off of wiki if I don't have like other sources so sure. obviously you start at google and of course I go to jstor and I'm like if I don't see something to back up what I'm looking at if I don't have a double source it doesn't go in mm. but it's very lax and I'm just literally just writing and it's like four pages and like she'll she'll keep she showed me the last time I was there binders <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I don't know where any of my sources went, honestly. They're all online. You can find <laughs> they're mostly they're mostly academic, but I couldn't pull it out of my ass in ten seconds. Like I don't have binders. It just <laughs> And I think also, um, like yes, we're talking mostly about women, but like at the same time, um there are, I, I think I mentioned this in the book club. I have holes in my history because I am not a history buff. Like mm. I had to learn how to be that for this podcast. Yeah. Um, so for me to be able to like refresh people's minds about like basic historical events, like give your like a little bit of historical context, which was originally when Megan had done and I hadn't started doing it for a little bit. And then I like geared towards it because it is, it is important to have the bigger picture. So that kind of helps build the story and fill in some holes that we might have, um, and put a little more like recognition and understanding with who you're talking about. And, and, and then I'm big on science things, too. How it impacts things today. Yeah. And I, I feel like, unfortunately, there's a lot of historical content when researching these people that we've learned about. And we almost see the same mistakes repeating over and over and over again because mm-hmm. people don't want to take the time to really learn about these events and grow from them, which is mm-hmm. really disappointing. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of... Because I'm, I'm listening to a historical podcast... Uh, which which is it's very famous it's like a comedy historical podcast and actually the two hosts are comedians it's called the dollop um but like it's pretty popular it's very funny they've been doing it for about four years but it's like i totally agree with what you're saying like it's just they they keep kind of tying whatever happened in the past kind of like to what's happening now and especially like i'm listening to episodes which happened just around the election that that particular you know <laughs> election <laughs> and yeah <laughs> And they just, a lot and of they're connections just like, that I made and got shut down for, and they're like, no, don't say that. That's so terrible of you. And I'm like, but it's true. There yeah, are parallels. Like, just saying. Huge parallels. And, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. And then I think, I think like you're saying too, like me too, I also have like huge gaps in my historical knowledge. So, you know, whatever's happening now, it seems, you know, new and unique, but actually it's not. It's happened before. It's happened many times before in many different places, but we just don't know about it. So I think, yeah, podcasting and blogging and, and historical fiction and all that kind of stuff is hugely important. Um, and it's important mm-hmm. to have access to. So Humans have anyway, a tendency think- to repeat themselves. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, it's true. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, ladies, for for doing all that research. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Putting it out. I don't think we would spend it any other way, honestly. (laughs) It is so satisfying, though, when a little random, like, knowledge nugget comes up and you're like, oh, that's the answer to the Jeopardy question. You're like, I only knew that because of some weird secondary (laughs) research hole I went down like three episodes ago. And you can be like, I smugly knew that that was Oberlin College, the first co-ed college in the United States. No. Oh. Yeah, so it's just, it's, it's little things like that, that <laughs> totally random, but it is satisfying when things come up and you're like, oh, hey, I actually happen to know a little bit about that because of, you know, some of the work that we've put into the podcast. So, I mean, I feel like ultimately if we had one listener, which would be Milana's mother, we would still do this because we both get a Truth. lot out of it. And it's, it's a lot of fun to have this project together. So it, it is rewarding. And it was only my mom for a while. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. You gotta start with family, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. on to the next topic. So who were your, who are, who are your top two favorite, uh, Wow, your top two feminist figures from history. Wow. <laughs> struggles struggles with I words. <laughs> I I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna be very honest with you. I could not come up with an answer. Okay. All right. Like like a specific answer. Okay, Megan let Megan go. Let like she's looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just I'm surprised because you've you've covered so many scientists that at various moments you're like, I personally feel for her. So 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like John Barry. Yeah. Uh, that was a, um, because I am, I, you, <laughs> Meg in your face, uh, because I am very medical. I like, I like to, I mean, I, I personally, physics and like, like philosophy are things that I want to bang my head against a wall. Like every time it comes up, I am more biology and medical. Um, and so I, but I still like to like keep it like even playing field because there's so many scientific fields, but like I will, uh, I'll, I'll treat myself and pull out like a physician. John Barry was a physician mm -hmm. who basically was like, I'm going to live my life as a man. Oh, I've oh. heard about her. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I, I can't even remember like the original name she was like born with. Uh, because like in history, she's John Barry and she was so well known and she was so like, like either loved her or hated her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like that's the kind of personality she had. Uh -huh. Um, so she had like this reputation of being like super harsh and like being in your face and like, but the, the truth of the matter is that she wanted everything done correctly. Like mm -hmm. she wouldn't bend on anything on like sanitation methods. And I mean. It's in important. the time that she lived in yeah. yeah but like then they're like oh no it's fine this is fine no it's not fine and at that point um, it was the early 1800s uh, yeah. yeah so there was a lot going on i was like that's not okay <laughs> like we look back and go we probably shouldn't have done that probably but we did um it, so. so there are there are women like that where i'm like yeah i totally understand because i don't bend for anything i'm extremely opinionated i'm very stubborn um so i have like this kid like kinmanship but at the end of the day like i think it, as long as you um are standing up for something no matter how you approach your feminism like everybody has a different personality everybody goes about it differently but as long as you're going about it you're on my book. Megan, how about you? Who's uh, your top feminist figure or top two feminist figures from history? One favorite of mine that we've covered is the sculptor Elizabeth Catlett. And I'm horrendously biased because I'm a sculptor. So that's just something that I, I favor covering them. But she was a kind of like mid to late 20th century African-American artist who coming of age in like the 1940s and 50s just realized how horrifically racist America was and was like screw this I'm going to Mexico <laughs> and so from there she was able to establish a really successful studio practice and also worked as an educator at one of the top national universities in Mexico and also took some of the social protest practices that developed in the wake of the Mexican Revolution and applied those to helping lay the groundwork for the Black Arts Movement during the Civil Rights era in the 1960s. So through her art and her education, she was really acting as a bridge for her content and also the awareness that she was raising in terms of like classism, sexism, and then also like the racism that was going on. So she was really interesting and, and fun to cover. And unfortunately, a lot of the topics that she covered in like the 1960s and 70s, the work is still relevant today, especially with last summer, all the protests mm. going on. And, and that's something where it's really yeah. sad to see these things repeating over and over again, because we collectively don't have a good foundational understanding of just the systemic racism and how that factors into almost every aspect of life, especially within the United States. So even depressing, her work I really respond to. And then on a bit of a lighter note, I am a really big fan of murder mysteries. Okay. <laughs> so there's a, a woman, also from 20th century American. So there's a woman, Frances Glesner Lee. She was an upper-class socialite in kind of like mid-20th century as well. And she was denied the chance to go to Harvard and ended up helping to develop their forensic program. And oh. she, she did so through the visual teaching aid of murder dollhouses. 
Oh, interesting. Ah, so using her resources and her kind of like meticulous uh, way of going about things, she crafted these just, like I said, amazing dollhouses that just happened to document a murder that had taken place. And they're still used as a teaching device for homicide detectives, like to this day. So she helped like with her funding and wow, through these pieces fantastic. lay the groundwork for being able to go in and objectively consider a whole crime scene and what could contribute, you know, to to someone's death. So that she was pretty wild to learn about too. And definitely rewarding because she was in a position where she she came from a family with money. She was able to channel that into something really rewarding that I mean we're still benefiting from today. So it's hard not to watch a murder mystery and not think about her. Uh, so th- those are just two people that if we hadn't have happened to go into podcasting, I would not have known about them. I had never heard about them before. Yeah. And you, I think, I think, like... oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say like, you know, that kind of reminds me. And I think it's something that I heard about in your podcast, maybe, but there was, oh gosh, what was it? It was a woman and it was, it was physics and they were talking about, oh, I can't remember the word. Something to do with physics, but she used, you know, for years, male scientists or male physicists had 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 problems trying to prove something existing. And then she kind of just like walked into the room, looked at it for like their calculations for a couple of minutes. And she was like, oh, I know what to do with this. And she crocheted the answer. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Was it your guys? What? Maybe. Maybe it wasn't your podcast. She crocheted it? Yeah. She crocheted it. She crocheted the answer. It was they were having some problems like representing like a mathematically. Mobius drip. Is it the Mobius? What? Drip? It has something to do with like the expansion of the universe. Crochet. I mean Yeah. Crochet. Okay, so I, I know I read about that, but I don't remember if Milena happened to cover someone who did that. I don't think I did, no. Okay. Hey, I I, w- <laughs> I wouldn't remember that one. <laughs> well, maybe- <laughs> No, but okay, like, know exactly what you're talking about. Guys, that sounds awesome. Okay, now she got. She oh, has to do my list. What's her name? It's a hyperbolic plane. Okay. Yeah. What's what is her name? I don't even. I don't know where I got this from. It, it it just came into my head suddenly. Maybe I was reading it on the internet. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I don't know where that came into. I don't know. Maybe I saw it on Twitter or something. But yeah, and isn't that cool though? Like, I just think it's really interesting. Like a dollhouse. Like you know, just having that female perspective of like, oh well, you know, we can solve this problem with like something that is really familiar to me from my childhood because I played with dolls. Or like same thing. Like you know, oh, I can do this because like you know, I learned to crochet. So you know, it's kind of those those parts like you know in art and science like and i think those two things are, are not mutually exclusive um but just having no, like a, yeah just having a different perspective can kind of you know find the solution mm-hmm. yeah so important for i think yeah. like one of our biggest examples like we always go we always go back to like who could have covered this particular person because um botanists they tend to uh have both like a like a right and left kind of brain where sure. they're like great at illustration, but they also like really like there, like there are some botanists I covered who discovered thousands of different species of like grass or like, like something ridiculous like that. And they're also like their illustrations or something that would be in a storybook. And you're like, so who, mm. where does this come? Like what, like, and I think that's also like that hits home with me because like I was a photographer for years, mm, right? Like right. that's what I went to college for. And now pulling like things, like it's it's such a weird thing to have like those two things going back and forth. Like I have my own creative outlets, but I also really love science. And like, it's everybody has this mindset of like, oh, you're one thing or another. And that's just not, it's just not true. Like even with Megan, that kind of logic that comes out of her is like, like, yeah, the the same skill sets that help fuel me, like in the studio, are the same ones that you mm-hmm. need if you're in the lab, if you're out on research. It's the same type mm-hmm. of like yeah. dedication and interest and just persevering because there's going to be so much failure, but that's part of the process, and you just have to learn to go with it and to be like, okay, well, I'll just do it better next time, or you know, mm-hmm. maybe my next experiment will hmm. come out better. It's just I tend to keep more poor paperwork yeah. compared to scientists. It's so important to have 
the ability to step back from what you're doing, whether it be uh, something that's a creative work or uh, something that's like more academic and take a step back and like re- give yourself a chance to relax or do something different before you come back to it. And like that change in like mode of like thinking allows you to come back to whatever activity you were stuck with or ha- struggling with or having difficulties and like see it in a completely different way because you just spend a lot of time doing something that you as another part of your brain that just like it ge- it, gave- it gives you that chance to just like flip the perspective or be like, oh, I didn't notice that before because I was just so focused on this other thing. Mm-hmm. hit refresh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And another aspect of it is good learning just I mean really but like the legacy of like women that we're coming from even if it feels like they don't have a direct influence on what we're doing I mean some of the women that we cover from decades centuries ago they've all fed into like us being able to go into the art studio or going into the the lab like they've all made contributions that it's rewarding if you're like, oh, I'm having a kind of a crappy day. And you're like, oh, well, remember when so-and-so couldn't even have an art studio? You're like, maybe my day's not so crappy after all. Mm. <laughs> in that respect, it just helps right. put it in a much, much broader real. perspective. Yeah. And I think, and kind of along that vein, so, you know, obviously women can get an education and participate in these sort of industries now and they couldn't in the past, you know, going so far as to disguise themselves as a man, et cetera. Um, But I mean, it's still not perfect even today. So in your guys' opinion, what are some challenges that women in the fields of art and sciences uh, face today? And what do you think the solutions to these problems could be? Oh, Oh, God. Yeah, (laughs) it's a heavy question. (laughs) It is so heavy, especially since like, I have such limited science experience, like aside from it being medical, Mm -hmm. um, I, I have the, the experience of being in a veterinary field for six years. So like when you're in a veterinary field, it's more women than men. Mm. Um, but then switching over to human medicine, it's very interesting Mm -hmm. because like you, you mentioned like, oh, you know, so-and-so ordered this CAT scan and they're like, was that the nurse? Like, I'm like, no, no nurses can't do that. Just because it's a woman doesn't mean it's a nurse. Mm. Um, so there are still like, even like today, like just, just that name is going to cause like immediate assumptions. Right. Um, or like having like patients immediately, like, like, no, I need a, I need a male doctor. Mm. Like I can't have anyone but a male doctor. And you're like, why? Like, <laughs> what's the what's the reason like sometimes it's personal like you're a man and you feel like that you you know share some things but like there are like moments where you're like there's legitimately no reason for that like it's not that you're worried about being a man and being seen by a man it's you're worried that a woman can't do the same work that you are and I think um I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts ologies by Allie Ward Mm -hmm. and there was one where she was um speaking to a scientist who dealt with coral Mm. and um like he was he was trans or okay. he was trans so, um female to male mm. um and that was like a specific thing where um he when he was presented as female um it was a lot of like he, he wasn't included in a lot of the work that was done like he was very excluded mm. as like every time like when he was presented, but as, as soon as he transitioned over, like he started recognizing and understanding like more doors were open for him because some people didn't know that he had transitioned mm. and they just were like, Oh yeah. Like you're part of the boys club. Come on in. And like, just, just that one individual saw like the complete, like the different world, like black and white, like how there's still a barrier and in hard sciences as well, like if you are a woman in science, you're expected to go into what is considered soft sciences. So mm. psychology, sociology, biology, biology is considered a soft science. But like when you have a woman who's like, I'm in physics, it's still like, if you look at a graduating class, there's only like three women physicists and like 30 male physicists. And you're like, how did that, how is that still happening? Mm. Um so I guess it all comes down to like 
I don't know, <laughs> acceptance, like understanding that these people are going to find their way into whatever field they want to. Mm. It's, it's, it's so hard to break down biases like that mm. and expect a woman now to be smart enough to do quantum mechanics. I don't know. It's really weird. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, no, fair. It's it's a it's a hard subject to talk about. Yeah. Um, May. So these days for the arts, it's usually a majority of women who are graduating with their MFAs and yet at the more like professional gallery level, men still outnumber women in terms of professional art world, like capital A W art world, um, professional representation. And for me, I feel like that lends itself to the type of sexism that you were talking about, Milena, because it's been so inherent for so many years. But one solution that I kind of see that might change things in time is like the decentralization of art representation because of social media. So artists Mm. are not necessarily reliant anymore on standard traditional gallery representation to try to get their foot in the door and being able to kind of subvert those traditional gatekeepers I feel like will potentially offer up a Mm. little bit more of a level playing field in the future so that's one area I do see there being like wiggle room but I mean like so many other women with this pandemic Mm. I mean so many women dropped out of the workforce and had to take on like full-time family responsibilities Mm -hmm. and that that's going to include artists too so there there is going to be that hit to someone's you know expected career trajectory because of it but I I feel like there is a little bit of room to kind of subvert the standard traditional pathway of how to be you know like a, a professional artist and so that offers a little bit of hope that artists aren't beholden to potentially misogynistic like you know gallery representation anymore but i mean that sexism it, it's still there so it's just something that you know will take time to gradually wear away at yeah yeah and i think a lot of people so ugh, a lot of men and people in general <laughs> but you should... <laughs> Well, they argue, and like I, I get really angry every time that I hear that. But the, you know, they argue that, oh no, that doesn't exist anymore. That doesn't exist anymore. Like, if you have the skills, or if you have the talent, or if you have the brains for it, then you'll be accepted. But that's simply, like, we we've seen time true. and time again, it's not true. Yeah, and like a yeah, lot, there is not. a lot of bias. Like, even if it's unconscious, just based on a name on a resume. If you have like a female name on a resume, you're probably not going to get hired like they'll hire a male over you even if you might be more qualified or you might have the Mm -hmm. the correct Mm -hmm. skills and you know something that I was listening to recently was talking about um this is like an arts thing but the phil I think it was like the New York Philharmonic Art Orchestra so in the past I think like most of the seats were men and always men and then so a lot of people said that like you know the hiring practice were discriminatory so in order to kind of make it more fair they started having blind auditions so the people who were like judging mm-hmm. the music would would only hear the music and then suddenly you know the i think like yeah f- females acceptance or women's acceptance like onto the orchestra changed dramatically like it shot up like 70 percent or something like that i can't really remember that's insane yeah just because just because even though they had the skills like just because they could see that they were women they were uh not given the parts right Right. they they were they were unconsciously Mm -hmm. judging them based on a personal bias that they may have picked up from schooling they may have picked up from their own personal experiences Mm -hmm. but whether they were aware of it or not, they were still using those unconscious biases to judge those people by. And, you know, the other thing that I wanted to mention about that was just like, there's nobody fostering young girls to pursue those kinds of things that they're interested in. They're just not getting the same opportunities, I guess. Not not opportunities. They're they're not being, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, (sighs) I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yes, they're not getting the encouragement. They're, it's yeah. being like, oh, well, you're a girl. You should do this instead. Oh, well, you're, you're, you know, you're a girl, so you're not smart enough to do this. Or, oh, you're not strong enough yeah. to do this. It's like, well, instead of telling me that I'm not good enough to do something, why don't you just let me try? 
And, you know, instead mm-hmm. of trying to block me from doing something, give me the stepping stones to, you know, actually accomplish the thing that I'm trying to do. Yeah, exactly. Now, a lot of the women that I've covered, I, um, there's like a, there's a common vein of them reaching out to their professors or whoever is supposed to be mentoring them and going, I am bored. Mm. Let me try this instead. <laughs> right. Um, and it's just, it's so fascinating because if it were the other way around, it would be that way. It would definitely not be that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, See ya. You know. Prospect of student, you're like, oh my God, this guy's so smart. He walks up to you and goes, Professor, I'm really bored. What else can I do? Of course, he's going to, you know, maybe give him some material if he thinks he's worth it mm-hmm. or, you know, worthy yeah. of it. But like a girl, you know, automatically dismissed. Then you have yeah, to, you know, yeah, sit there some... and you have to fight for it. You have to prove that you deserve it. You have to be like, I want this. You will give it to me or I'm just going to take it and do it anyways. And then maybe. Yeah, like, I belong here. Yeah. Mm. Maybe they'll begrudgingly be like, you know what? You do belong here. Here's the thing that you've always wanted. You're like, Psh, I already got it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. And like, it's so, it's so fascinating to me because these women, you know, you cover them from like different centuries, but like. Then you, you look at your everyday, like you, you get out of researching and then you go about your life when you're not on the podcast with me. And I see it every day. Like I see the same things happening over and over again. And it's 2021. Mm. Like it's not the 1700s. It's like, why are we still asking for the same opportunities? Yeah. And it's, it's it a is lot. rewarding for people <laughs> yeah, yeah. that we've covered that have had the foresight to help establish like schools and and teaching curriculum that help encourage others so like on my end Mm -hmm. uh, a few episodes Mm -hmm. ago we covered the soprano dorothea um, maynard and she went on to found the harlem school of the arts that was when she was retired she had a whole second career as an educator and so every now and again we come across people like that Mm -hmm. wow realize how tough it was for them to get to the the professional level that they were at and turn around and are like how can I help others achieve just as much as I did and even more Mm -hmm. yeah and give back yeah that's really and that's probably like the light at the end of the tunnel like if more women helped other women or girls to step up if they gave them that opportunity and gave them that like that road that they had paved like instead of you know well I think when we're when we're young we're taught like other other girls are the problem like other girls are the like they're the enemy Mm -hmm. oh yeah you're gonna have to fight them yeah Yeah. you're gonna have to compete against for that position if we had more women helping other women up it would be 10 times easier Mm. truthfully true yeah um I think it's a change on everyone's part, unfortunately. Yeah, just have to be more willing to accept that gender is not a deciding factor in what education level you're going to achieve, what career mm-hmm. path you're going to follow, or what uh, talents you have naturally that deserve to be fostered. Truth. Mm-hmm. And help each other. Yes. <laughs> Gosh darn it. <laughs> Be excellent to each other. Yeah. We are women here. Okay? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> true, true, true. Oh, man. <laughs> Alrighty. I guess we'll just go ahead and wrap up then. So uh, thank you guys so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I know it's late where you guys are. And so we really appreciate it. Yeah, it was a really. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course, of course, it was a really great interview. Um, so, if our listeners want to learn more about your podcast and what you do, where should they look? So we are on uh, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn. We have a website, myfavoritefeminist.com. Both of our Instagram and Facebook are My Favorite Feminist, and then on Twitter. I wish I have to be much better at it's at Milana Megan. So that's at M I L E N A M E G A N. Uh, and then if you want to reach out, we also have a, like an email info at my favorite feminist. I think that's everything. Did I miss anything, May? No, no, you covered it for the podcast. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> that's our, that's our sign out. Really? I literally just spewed it at you. It's fine. <laughs> <Boom>. <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. And as always, for our listeners, if you like the episode, please like, comment, and subscribe.
Yeah, or sign up. I don't really know what's going on. Some some things have changed. Anyway, tweet, hashtag, anyway, whatever you can do. So please do it because it really helps us out. And check out My Famous Feminist for sure. They're absolutely fantastic. We'll have their information probably in our show notes and descriptions of this episode. All right. Bye. Thank you so much for having us, guys. Bye. 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 Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Hey, this is Caitlin from Get Over It. I'm here to share some exciting news with you. It's now easier than ever to support our team. How, you ask? By going to patreon.com slash getoveryit, you can sign up for one of our three membership tiers. This gives you access to monthly AMAs, bonus episodes, and behind-the-scenes content. As always, all donations will be subsequently donated to the charities Cool Earth and the Center for Reproductive Rights. Thanks for listening. That's it for today, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in. And as always, please support this work by subscribing and donating to our cause at www.teamgetoveryit.com. Donors get access to specific content like stickers, t-shirts, and postcards from our journey. You can donate for as little as $5 and the benefits build from there. Go to our website for more info or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Team Get Over It. Thanks for listening and catch us next time on Get Over It. So it's, uh, it's been fun. I've been sharing process pictures online as I've been working on it. And someone commented how uh, it looks like an expression of when you accidentally open your front facing camera on your phone. And I was like, yeah, oh, that, yeah. that equally it does. works. In terms it of, like, oh, that's my face. Oh, who lets me out in public? So there, there's a good bit of humor that plays itself in the middle, which is always That's fun. Funny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I come prepared. Always. I saw, I saw you being all sneaky. You're just like, do, 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 do. Don't mind me. <laughs>